Good evening and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, uh, to our dangers of the dark web and why we need to be cybersecurity savvy. Uh, we are delighted to have you join us this evening. Um, I know that we've got a lot of mums and dads and I think maybe even some kids are joining. Um, and I think even aunts and uncles have been invited to attend this session because it is an intriguing, it's an intriguing topic at the moment. And I think we all know that technology is advancing at an exponential rate. And with that comes all sorts of benefits. We save time, we can do amazing things. But along with the benefits, there are also some risks with using technology. And I think as technology keeps advancing, we're all just going to have to learn how we manage those risks and manage and uh, manage our behavior around those. So with the advances within technology, we also unfortunately see an increase in cyber attacks. And that's not just globally. We see a lot of this taking place in South Africa as well. And so this is where our behavior management needs to come in and, and we need to start thinking about what we do to protect ourselves and also our children. So at Kuru, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about this at the end of the call, um, we've got a lot of infrastructure, infrastructure security in place. So things like um, firewalls and all sorts of things to keep our children safe, password management, that sort of thing. Um, but the weakest link is us. And if we don't do something or we do do something. So it's a little bit like your home. We may have um, we may have the best security. We may have alarms. We may have electric fences. Uh, burglar bars, but if we have a, a, a thief knocking on our door and we open up the door, all of that hard or security infrastructure means nothing if our behavior isn't appropriate. So think of cybersecurity in the same way. We all need to think about how we can actually manage our behavior. So with that, um, and in fact, before I hand over to our guest speaker this evening, to Jason, just a few quick sort of logistics details. If you've got any questions as we're going along, you'll see that there's a little Q&A uh, uh, section. You can just click on that. You can ask your questions and we'll try and get to questions at the end. Um, this will also be recorded. So we're going to post the recording on our YouTube channel so that you can watch it again or you can share it with anybody else that might be interested. So, and I didn't actually introduce myself. I'm Angela Scherer, so I work in the Kuro technology team and um, we're partly responsible for making sure that everybody at Kuro is safe from a, from a, a technology usage perspective. So with that, I'm very um, excited to hand you over to uh, Jason Petrie, who is a cyber defense analyst at the core group. And Jason is going to be spending some time this evening explaining a little bit about how the dark web works, because it's important for us to actually understand, you know, we all know that we shouldn't click on a phishing link, but what actually happens if we do click on a phishing link? What happens to that data? We all hear about this dark, the dark web and it's this sort of mysterious um, sort of unknown entity, but what is it about? And Jason's actually going to take us through what happens if you click on a phishing link? What happens if there's a data breach? What do people do with this stuff? So that you understand a little bit more, you know, about why we should be careful. Um, so Jason, thank you so much for joining us this evening. We're delighted to have you and over to you. Great, thank you. And you know, as Angela said today, I'm you know, really excited to have some of your, your time to talk about the danger of the dark web um, and how this actually, you know, how the kind of like the, the bustling hub of cybercrime plays into our daily lives and and how cybersecurity becomes important, you know, to us in our day to day um, actions online. So before we get started, a little bit of, a little bit about me, um, as Angela mentioned, I'm a cyber defense analyst. Um, mostly I work with what we call vulnerability management, it means, you know, I look at networks and systems and try and figure out how to keep the bad guys out there and keep the, the good people working. Um, a little bit about me. I'm really excited about you know this topic and about cyber security in general. And I spend a lot of my time, you know, <laughs> researching different aspects of, of the field. Um, a lot of time, you know, kind of browsing around the dark web, doing research on the dark web, and all of these groups that we see, you know, being quite active in in the cybercrime space. Um, and I also spend a lot of time, you know, on kind of platforms that you can hone your skills in in cyber security. So that results to kind of a, a top 1% ranking at the moment. Um, and, you know, I love using this because I, you know, I get to brag a little bit when I have the chance. So hopefully, you know, it gives you a little bit of confidence that I can take you through this and hopefully we will have quite a nice journey today um, as we walk through this whole idea of how a cybercrime unfolds and how does it affect us as individuals? 
So we very, very briefly are going to look at, you know, what is cybersecurity? I'm going to bore you with the, you know, three minute breakdown. And then we are going to run through, you know, why cyber should be important to you. We're going to look at like this idea of how a single person you know, gets targeted, even though they aren't the main, you know, goal in, the, in this attack. And we'll work through this whole uh, attack. And then as Angela mentioned, we're going to place a lot of focus on going back to the dark web, understanding this kind of like bustling hub of cybercrime. And then we're going to finish off with a very few you know, top tips on how we can stay safe online and just keep you know, on top of, of our own devices and our own online profile. So with that being said, let's try and understand the basics of cybersecurity very, very briefly. So when we look at cybersecurity, it really comes down to ensuring what we call confidentiality, integrity and availability of our networks. Um, as well as our devices and our data. So what this means is that we want to be able to ensure that we always have you know, our, our data. So you know everything that we store online about ourselves, our emails um, available to us, as well as our devices need to work when we want them to. We don't want to be locked out of our own devices, as well as our home networks and you know, scaling up to larger scale networks, such as your, your home network, uh, your, your office network, and you know, kind of at a, at a country scale, you know, our kind of global network. In addition to that, what we want to do is we want to ensure that that data networks and devices you know has integrity meaning that our data is only modified by us no one else can modify it that you know no one else can access your your device your smartphone and change some settings on it as well as your home networks we don't want people in those to to change them so that's where integrity comes in that you know we leave things how we want it to and no one else changes it for us and we can understand this is where the risks of people stealing your devices comes in or stealing your data comes in and finally, you know, we, we have so much private information nowadays running across you know, our networks, our smartphones, our devices, and all of this data is so key to our day-to-day -day lives. So we really want that to be confidential to us when it's, you know, when, when it's something a little bit more private or when it's more sensitive data. So this is where cybersecurity comes in to ensure that. And this is realistically our main job focus as, as cybersecurity experts or cybersecurity specialists. So we understand this big breakdown and, and it's one of those topics where, you know, we, we always explain it, you know, you know, the, the confidentiality, integrity and availability, but I don't really think that hits. So why should you really care about cybersecurity? Why should it be important to you? And this is where we get into what I like to term the pyramid of horror. So the, the main thing to me why cybersecurity should be important to us in our day to day lives is because we have to remember and be very aware that there's a strong chance that our data may already be out there. So there are multiple studies that have been done, you know, across 2021 and, and this year as well, that found that on average, you know, across the world, the average user has about 150 online accounts. So 150 is a large number, but the more we think about it, the more realistic this becomes. When we start thinking, okay, well, you know, we, we actually created this account on that funny website that we wanted to, you know, use to look at a PDF or, you know, modify our picture. And, you know, we've got one for Facebook and then, oh, but we've also got one for Instagram and, and the list builds so quickly. Um, and this doesn't really sound like something that's so concerning until we really start to realize that by best practice, what we really should be doing is having unique passwords for all of these different sites. And I love that idea. I love that saying of unique passwords because when, when you say it to people, and it's a, it's a pity that you know things are always like online now, but when you say unique passwords for everything, people get this look of shock in their face because 150 passwords is a lot of passwords to remember and it's a lot of passwords to try and keep track of. But the reason why that's so important is because we must remember that if we have you know one password for all of our accounts, that means that one of those accounts being breached means that all of our accounts are at risk. If your username and password is shared, that means like your these attackers can potentially compromise everything um, in terms of your online profile. So this is concerning, and you know uh, now we're looking at these stats and we're saying oh, 150 accounts, unique passwords. But you know I'm okay. Uh, my data has never been breached. Well, this is where I start to say you should really start rethinking that because this year alone there's been 39.4 million records that have been breached from various different platforms. And some of those are large platforms. Um, the IBM did a study earlier this year where they showed that most large organizations have almost a 30% chance of experiencing a data breach of customer facing data. 
Uh, you know, that, that being your username, your password, maybe your account details, what did you buy? And this is something that we see often. It's, it's, not, a, it's not a unique um, situation. So we do, see it, we do see it a lot. So there's a good chance our, our accounts have already been breached. And this is why we want to try and keep on top of that and always have those unique passwords. Additionally, we have to remember, so now this data has been breached and we have to be very aware of what this data is online. You know, it's not always just a username and password. We see people, you know, putting their, putting our ID numbers into online sites so that we can verify our identity. You know, your home address and your delivery information is, is great knowledge for attackers to use. Um, and studies further show this. We, 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 did, well, we saw a study earlier this year by a software firm called FICO that actually stated that 17% of you know, the respondents in this study had been victims of fraud already in 2022. And then if we look at the South African markets, you know, in 2021 alone, um, there was a report that 37% of you know, South Africans who have an online profile were targeted by some type of COVID-19 related scam. So we've got a very small subsection of scams with a large you know, market share of people experiencing them. So this is very real. And we understand that you know, identity theft is quite a serious crime and it's got very serious implement imp implications. We start to see you know, financial loss in identity theft and we start to see reputational damage occurring when people steal our identities. And to make it worse, um, what's very concerning to me is that cybercrime is an extremely popular industry. It is growing year by year. Um, every quarter, cybercrime is getting larger and larger. So a study was done um, that found on average, you know, um, a, 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 the price of malware, so the price of viruses and, and you know, ransomware and all of this stuff on the dark web will run you about one US dollar. So I think the exchange rate today is sitting at around 17 Rand on the dot. Um, so for 17 Rand, you could download viruses that could be you know, very damaging and harmful to, to people around you. Um, and if you know, viruses and malware isn't your particular taste of you know, crime, um, we can see that you know, for the price of $3, you can buy someone's you know, social security number or ID number and use that for identity theft. So we see a lot of risk and a lot of growth within the cybercrime industry. And you know, to further that, we actually found um, a, a study by CNBC in America that stated that in 2021, um, the, the cybercrime industry generated $547 million from romance scams alone. And that is a very small subsection of, of the cybercrime industry. Ransomware on average, you know, deals a lot higher than that. So we, we see a, a big trend. There's a lot of money in cybercrime, and this is the reason why it's growing. And this growing interest in cybercrime, you know, really does make that pyramid base bigger and bigger and bigger. And we start to see, you know, point one and two getting more and more prevalent each and every year. So we've got a lot to worry about. And the thing with cybercrime is it's so disconnected from us because it's in a digital world that we don't often get to, you know, understand or see how this type of attack takes place. So this is where I want to join in and, you know, kind of hopefully give you an insight into the world of cybercrime and a very brief overview, a very brief case study of how these cybercrimes occur from the very start, from the person who's you know, interested in doing something nefarious to the, the data being stolen and you know, being taken back to the dark web. So what I want to run through is a case study. Um, and obviously for, you know, uh, for reasons we have you know, generated all of the, the company names and all of the, the people's names, they are all fictitious and they just follow a path that we've seen prior. So what this means, we're going to look at a company called Bionic Workforce and South Heart to see how an attack occurred there. And the first place we start is we you know, load up a, a special little web browser and we go into the dark web. And we see on the dark web plenty, plenty marketplaces. The, the dark web is very popular for selling items or requesting items. So you know, this will cover our traditional things that we expect to see you know, from you know, drugs and illegal items all the way to cybercrime. And on this particular dark web forum called Nightgator, this is exactly what we see. So on Nightgator, we can see that we've got a, uh, you know, a, a cyber criminal here that's called Dr. Hacker with a three in it. And Dr. Hacker is looking for access to a company that's called South Heart. And if we look there at the top of the screen, um, we can see that access is wanted to South Heart, which is a South African medical service provider that has high profile clients. And this is exactly the way that these attacks, you know, quite often start. This is a very, you know, interesting scenario because it's very public. This person is showing that they want, you know, access to this company. 
Normally this happens with inside one group, so we don't see these postings, but this is a lovely example of it. So what we see here is that this person, Dr. Hackers, you know, asked and they said they were willing to pay upwards of $5,000 for this access. And you know, this is really what they're looking for. And at the top of the screen, we see, you know, because it's the dark web, everything works in cryptocurrency. So we see a nice current price of Bitcoin at the top there for you to pay Dr. Hacker or for Dr. Hacker to pay you in Bitcoin. And this is where our hacker for hire comes into play. On the dark web, hacker for hires is a very lucrative market. You know, what we see is people utilize their skill sets uh, for the for the wrong side of, of the law or on the wrong side of the law to hack companies, hack people, and you know, generate some profit out of it. So generally what we see on the dark web is it's mostly done for Instagram accounts and Facebook accounts, but every now and again we get lucky enough to catch one that's for a much larger scale hack. So in our instance here, we can see that our hacker for hire is called Sergeant Hack, and Sergeant Hack is an online hacker for hire who has actually got quite good reviews. So the nice thing with um, the dark web and with cybercrime and all of these marketplaces that we see is that they they truly do function like a real website and a real company. They value their they they value their peers and they value the the reviews of the users on their site. So yeah, we can see that Sergeant Hack has got you know five out of five stars for all three of their ratings, and you know people are saying that it's good and it works and they got their payment when they wanted their payment. So everything is really good here. So this is where it starts. We've got interest on the dark web and we've got a request and someone who's more than happy to try and meet that request for their, you know, for their bounty. And this is where we can break into a very kind of step back timeline of what we expect to see. And this is generally speaking from a, you know, an ethical hacking point of view, a, you know, the hacking side of, of, of what, what's going to occur here. From the hacker's point of view, the first thing to do is research this company that someone wants access to. So we're going to research South Heart. The attacker is then going to look for a target within South Heart. They're going to then pivot and research, you know, where that person works for. More so, find people, research people, and after that, now we're going to get to the like the meat of it, and we're going to create these phishing emails that we always get told to be aware aware of, steal some data, and then we'll go back to the dark web to to talk about how and what happens to that data afterwards. So this is where we can talk about our lovely medical aid provider, South Heart. They are a South African company that has services around 3 million customers. So quite a large company. When we look at them, um, we can get into the first step. And what attackers do is they open up everyone's favorite tool. They open up Google and they type, type in South Heart here. So they're going to go and look for some common things. We can see, you know, we'll look for, you know, is it South Heart and Karting? Who is the CEO? Do they have a branch in Kempton? Um, you know, what are the plans, some prices, are there doctors associated with it? And my favorite one and most you know, attackers favorite one is actually, let's look at their LinkedIn profile. LinkedIn is an amazing tool for finding out lots and lots of information about people. So what we can see is that South Heart, you know, is, is you know, true to what they say, they are a medical aid provider, but what's very interesting in this situation is that it's a relatively small, you know, company. We can see that they've got 26 employees on LinkedIn. And for a company that services over 3 million people, we would imagine it to be a bit larger. So from the attacker's point of view, this is, you know, the, the bells are ringing because what we start to imagine here now is that they utilize a lot of different outsourcing. They want people to come in and do everything that they can so they can keep the team size small. So we have to carry on looking at the LinkedIn profile a little bit to find a nice connection here. And this is exactly what attackers want to do. They want to find a connection between you know, a big company and you as a person, because this is where value starts to come into it. Because a large company is very hard to attack. As, as Angela mentioned, companies put a lot of effort into their technology, into their infrastructure. They secure every, like we secure everything we can to ensure that it's as hard as possible for attackers to get in. But unfortunately, people are, are, are not as easy to you know, work with as technology. Um, not everyone does awareness training and not everyone understands why cyber is a concern to us. So what we do here as an attacker is we find that connection and in this situation it was absolutely brilliant. Because what we could see in this situation is that South Heart actually was promoting some of their service providers. You know, they were running awards at their yearly, at the year in function where they were nominating people and really, you know, showcasing them. So we can see that in this case, South Heart said that they're very excited to, you know, announce their service partner of the year. Um, and they gave it to this lovely lady called Sandile and Corsi um, because she was just amazing at work that year. 
and they and South Art themselves were really excited to work with her. And we can see that they said, you know, um, she works for a company called Bionic Workforce. This is the company that she's contracted through, and they have a partnership with South Art. So that brings us to our next step. Once again, we have to dive back to the research. Um, and as attackers, what what the, what's generally going to happen? Is we're now going to start looking at bionic workforce and we do those very you know, advanced google searches again we go to our favorite to tool google and we look at them a little bit and we see that they are a service provider and they provide cyber security solutions um the technical term for it is a managed security service provider they work with the, a, you know across the SEMA region so we see lots of branches in the africa region um, and they are based in south africa it looks like they're somewhere in cape town by the by the, the, by the map here so what does this mean for for us um well for us this means we have now got a very interesting scenario. We've got this one lady from a company that's obviously doing some services for the, the, the medical aid provider that we are extremely interested in to, to get access to, um, and it's a service provider. And by the nature of this lady's job, um, she will generally have quite a lot of access. You know, she's got all the username and passwords that everyone wants. The attackers look at her and she's like the, 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 the golden ticket. So if we you know, quickly brief over her details, we can see that she is what we call an Azure security engineer. This means that she works on the infrastructure and the technology that Angela was mentioning earlier. From some research that we could actually see that she was quite recently promoted, she deals with clients on a day-to-day -day basis, and she's actually quite active on social media. We can see on her LinkedIn that she likes posting about her achievements, and, and it's great because this is what LinkedIn is there for. However, we have to be and remember to be so careful with what we post online, because in this case, we can see that she has posted, you know, that she's an Azure security engineer, that she's a security administrator, and you know, from South Heart's post, we can we also know that she works with them. So this is where we get into what you know, where I start to really find this stuff interesting. We talked about data breaches earlier, and we talked about how many millions of records have been breached in 2022 alone. So this is something that we have to be cognitive of. And I mentioned we have to be you know, kind of acutely aware that our accounts have a good chance of really being breached. So, and I also mentioned how large platforms uh, experience these data breaches as well. And LinkedIn is not, you know, um, exempt from this. In 2017, LinkedIn had suffered a massive data breach where millions of customer or client details were leaked. Those details included, you know, what we call the, the LinkedIn member ID, as well as their email addresses. So when we look at this, um, it's actually quite easy to get. So what we do is we open up, you know, LinkedIn on the person's page that we're interested in. We then search for um, or, or go and view the page source, which is just all of the, the code that makes up the LinkedIn you know, page that you see on the internet. And if we search for something called member and then put a code on there, we receive what is known as the LinkedIn member ID. This is a very special value that just, you know, is used by LinkedIn to identify who you are. Now, what email address is used behind this account? And they'll use that quite often to pull out all the information about you so that your LinkedIn profile is actually your LinkedIn profile. And this is something that they'll do or that LinkedIn does. So what this means is that because all of that data was breached in 2017, if you know what you look what what to look for, you can quite often find the databases of this leaked data or this breached data with the LinkedIn data breach, for example, it's actually quite easy to find and it's, it's, it's free actually for, for you to look for. So attackers can quite easily grab something like that. And then what they do is they can search through that file to look for your LinkedIn member ID. So in this situation, they use a tool called grep, which is just a nice little searching tool um, that, that, that's in like a, a command line interface. And it, attackers will generally use command line because it's quite quick for them to use and they can use a variety of different tools. But right here we can see that we've actually got Sandile's Gmail account as well as her work account. So now we've got two different emails to go after her. And this is where it starts to get very concerning. And this is why we want to be very aware about our usernames and our passwords on different accounts across the internet. Because Sandile's account now is realistically breached. And if she's using the same password across different accounts, we've got multiple areas to, to attack her from. We've got multiple accounts that we can try and log into. We've got multiple accounts that we can try and send phishing emails to as well. And that's exactly what we're going to do in this instance. We're going to try and look and do a little bit more research about Sandile to see if we can find anything that would make a convincing reason for her to interact with us over email to, you know, in a, in a traditional phishing sense. So what we do and what attackers generally do is start using now, you know, proper tool sets. So we've talked about how attackers use Google and how Google is this amazing tool. Um, and by all means it is, but sometimes we do want to use a little bit more of an advanced toolkit. 
So in this instance, what we use is a tool called G Hunt, which stands for Google Hunt. Um, and what we do is we throw in that email address, specifically the Gmail one that we found, and it's going to search through there and it's going to find us you know, a whole bunch of information about Sandile's Gmail account. We can see that it finds a profile picture. We can see that it finds that she's, it's got active um, you know, Google services such as photos and maps. These are you know, fascinating examples. But what's very interesting to us is that Google Maps uh, in particular, because what do we generally do on Google Maps? We see where people live and we can make reviews on Google Maps. And in this particular instance, we can learn a lot about Sandile from this information. So my favorite thing to do is look at what they do quite often, and we can see that there's a variety of different hospitals around um, that have been marked. Um, there's also, you know, a few golf clubs, um, and, and generally there's a few dams. So we can see that Sandile seems to be quite an outdoorsy person, maybe had some medical problems in the past. Maybe those hospitals are part of South Heart that she's been interacting with. So there's a lot to learn here. Um, but what we find really interesting is this response from an owner from some golf lessons that Sandile went to. And we can see that the, the owners actually come back and responded like, Ha Sandile, we do apologize for any problems that you may have had with their service. Um, and they would actually love to resolve this issue with you. So as an attacker and as someone looking to do phishing, this is like, the, like I, I, love, I love this term of golden ticket, but this really is a golden ticket. Because now there's a legitimate reason for someone to interact with Sandile. And we can actually start you know, emailing her. And it's not going to seem so fishy and weird when they get an email talking about golf lessons and, you know, please click here for a refund or something. And now we've got this a concept of an idea that we can follow. So that's exactly what we do. Um, this is a little tool that I built a while ago to perform some phishing activities. And all it does is it makes a, an email look like it's from someone else except from you. So in this instance, we want to be from golf lessons. Um, so we'll put in there that, you know, our email wants to be from golf at lessons.com. That seems very convincing. And we want to send it to Sandile and Corsi 324 at gmail.com. And then we fill out some information there. You can see that the subject says we would like to make it up to you. Um, and we say reply to this email with the filled out document. Regards, Jared, golf lesson director. You know, we make that up. We'll just say that the guy's name is Jared, for example. Um, so... And then what we'll do is we'll attach a document to this as well. So what does that realistically look like? Um, and what it does look like is this. So the problem that is so concerning about phishing is that like something as simple as the tool that I've made there can quite easily bypass these free email services that we use, such as Gmail. And what we can see here in the top of the screen is that email coming through to Sandila's inbox. We can see that it says golf lessons. We'd like to make it up to you. When we open that email, you know, it says there, hi, Sandile, we trust you well. We recently noticed a complaint from you on our Google business. We're really sorry about this issue that you've had with our service, and we would like to make it up to you by offering a compensation gift. And then now we have to put the hook, line, and sinker. So we say, please, to receive three free golf games as well as three, you know, hours of lessons, please fill in the document below and reply to this email with the filled up document. So we've asked them quite nicely to please click on that lovely little document at the bottom which hopefully we all know by now um, it, it is quite a bad thing to do. This is where attackers like to put the nefarious viruses and, and, and whatnot. So, and that's really it. That's how it happens. All it takes is one click from Sandile. And I'm very briefly going to discuss the, you know, some, how something occurs here. Um, realistically, what we have in, in cybersecurity and in security in general is vulnerabilities. So one of the vulnerabilities that we can see is this number on the screen, CV2022-30190. That is particularly talking about a, a problem, let's call it, a, a vulnerability or problem within Microsoft Word that actually allows an attacker to remotely access your machine if you download the document and click on it. So what this means is that they can have a connection you know, to and from your machine and they can look at your files, they can you know, modify things, and they can break all of those, you know, CRA, that confidentiality, integrity that we were talking about at the very beginning. So this is where cybersecurity obviously comes in to try and prevent that. But this is the problem because they can modify and see your data, which means they can steal your data once they've got this remote access. And this is where we see they make their third step and they go back to the dark web to steal your data um, and, and sell it there. So this means we have to now understand the bigger picture of the dark web. Um, and this is, I really love the, this slide because we, we've talked through this whole scenario and it's like, you know, it's, to me, it's always fascinating how we can see, you know, how us as individuals can become a victim of this. You can you know, be working a job role um, and all of a sudden, you know, you get, a, you get an email about some golf lessons and, you know, you, you're not even 
you know, a part of the target, but you are unfortunately the victim of, of this attack. You may be, you know, just part of a bigger organization and somebody just is using you as that door, as Angela mentioned. Um, the, the, your company may have put up all these doors, um, but you, you may be the person who opens it for, for the attacker. So what happens after this? You know, we, we can become the victims, but what happens to the data and happens to everything afterwards? So um, as we saw, we can talk about what we know already. There's a generally starts with a request or there, there's this desire from an attacker or a group of people to have access or to have some type of data stolen from a company. Generally what happens there is we see hackers get involved um, and this is where we can become the victim. Like we can see somebody looks at our Google account and they find some of our views and they find a reason to interact with us and put some you know, malware and viruses on our machine, maybe even steal our username and passwords as well. What they do after this is they, they, they have that remote access that we we're talking about. So now that they've gotten access to your computer, you know, that, that's very valuable to people. And what's amazing about the dark web and about cybercrime is things really do act like a big supply chain. The people that, you know, the, the hackers aren't interested in selling the data most of the time. The hackers are interested in getting in and, and getting and breaking into your machine or stealing your username and password. Once they have that, you know, often most of them feel like their job is done. So they'll pass it up the ladder or, or up the supply chain, we should say, and give that data to someone else or give that access to someone else so it can go for sale. And this is where your company, you know, can go, your company's network can be for sale. If it's your personal machine, like this is the one thing, please don't think you're exempt just because, you know, you're one person. I see every day postings about, you know, someone's username and password being for sale on the internet for their Microsoft account or for their Facebook account. These are things that we see quite often. But the bigger picture is that data goes for sale. And then once again, it's a supply chain. The people who sell data don't want to be putting the ransomware or, 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 or you know, the, the malware on your machines. There's a group for that. There's a supply chain for that. So they'll sell that access to the ransomware groups who will now encrypt all your files sometimes. You know, this is the idea of ransomware, they encrypt your files um, and they take your data hostage and wait for you to pay them some type of ransom so you can have your data back. And then once again, um, you know, it's a supply chain. So once that's happened, once that data has been stolen and you know, you've paid these ransomware groups and they've told you that they're going to give your data back and they didn't steal it, the, the, the end story is that they probably have, but they won't use that data. They are going to sell it in a marketplace. So the, they give it to the marketplaces, they sell it to the marketplaces, who then resells it. So this is where the data is sold off. Um, and this is actually quite concerning because this is where end users and yourself can become affected once again. So your data may have been stolen and your access, your credentials may have been stolen already. But once they work their way down the supply chain and end up at that last part, they're going to go for sale again to a larger audience. This is where we see quite often, you know, the, the data breaches where people's, you know, Facebook details are for sale or access to a person's computer is for sale. Maybe it's, you know, if you or your children do gaming, this is where gaming accounts go for sale. So this is where really realistically we see the supply in there. But this is also where people become the targets of, you know, more and more phishing attacks. Because if your email's out there on the dark web and we understand that there's a good chance it is, um, this is where attackers can start using those emails in long, you know, BCC lists or, or long lists of emails and just start spamming you. And this is often where a lot of your spam comes from. So it's a lot and it feels like we've got this constant barrage of attacks against us and we always have to be careful. So how do we actually do that? How do we be careful and how do we stay safe online? Well, the first thing that I always love to push for is be aware of phishing. Phishing is actually one of our largest you know, problems within the cybersecurity industry, and it's one of the biggest attacks that we see against the general public. So with phishing, you know, and when you are dealing with emails, we always want to push you to think before you click. And this actually tran like transfers over away from your emails to you know, direct messages that you might get in um, Instagram or Facebook, as well as SMSs that you get. We see quite often, I'm sure everyone experiences it, that you've won, you get an SMS that you've won some competition. You just have to click this link to you know, redeem it. So always think before you click those links. And if possible, take the driver's seat. If you get an email that asks you to log into some website or click some link, rather type that, that website or that link into the browser yourself. So open up a new tab. And if the email says it's from Microsoft, type in Microsoft and go to Microsoft yourself. The beauty of it is we can't fall victim to these links if we never click them. It, it does add additional workload to you, but it does make you that much more secure. 
And if you've done that, if you think before you've clicked and you've taken the driver's seat um, and you're still not sure, always confirm. Um, pick up the phone, call whoever it may be and ask them if you sent an email. If it's the bank, you know, call the bank and ask them. If it's a colleague, a friend, you know, call them and ask because this way we obviously just take the risk out of clicking without knowing. We, we looked a lot today at Sandile's online profile and how it was used against her. So what I really want to encourage today is to please always think before you post. You need to think about what information you're giving out and how it can be used against you. And in addition to that, we live in an online world where it's so easy to connect with hundreds and hundreds of people. And from a cyber perspective, I do really want to challenge you to try and connect with who you know. Choose who you connect with. Make sure that there's a legitimate reason to connect to someone because unfortunately, not everyone on the other side of the account is you know or has the same intentions as you do and then lastly we saw today that linkedin had you know a data breach um so what you or the, one of the things i want to encourage is to always choose your platforms we see a lot of talk about you know facebook and whatsapp and how they use your data and we always hear about uh, how unhappy people are about what facebook is doing with their data so take the time and, and, and google and do some research into what data they hold on you and how they use it and see if you actually agree with it or if you feel comfortable with it. And if you don't, move away from those platforms. There's, al there's always alternatives to platforms that we use. I also want to put some emphasis on updates. So I mentioned earlier that our, our cell phones and our laptops are so ingrained in our day-to-day -day lives that you know they do really control us sometimes. And and with that, I'm always amazed that you know some like people won't really care about their updates. And I think it might be like everyone thinks that updates are just for new features and it makes it better. But what updates also do is they secure your mobile applications and your mobile devices. So when you get those updates on your mobile phone and on your laptop and your desktop, please click on them, give it the time to update. I, I know it can feel like an inconvenience at times, but it really does make you just that much more secure. Additionally, look at your software. Um, we talked very very briefly about how microsoft word can have a vulnerability that allows attackers remote access so when you see those updates on word or adobe or whatever it is that you use take the time and update it it will really you know once again just make you that much more secure and finally on my list of you know staying safe online um look at your passwords um we, we talked about it at the beginning you know the average user of the internet has 150 accounts which do really require you know unique passwords to make sure that 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 we stay safe online. The idea of unique passwords means that if one account is breached and someone has our username and password for Facebook, for example, that they won't be able to get into our Gmail account or they won't be able to get into our Microsoft account. And, and this is where the beauty of unique passwords comes in. But it can be difficult. It is very difficult to remember 150 unique passwords. So there are plenty of tools out there such as password managers. A lot of your devices, such as um, Apple devices, will have a built-in password manager that will remember your passwords for you and allow you access to them through the use of a single password. So the idea here is you save all your passwords and accounts onto the password manager and you only provide it one password. That password could be your face, it could be your fingerprint or like a physical, you know, you type in the password and then it will do the rest of the work for you. So this way it's actually quite easy to have those 150 unique passwords. And then finally, the biggest one is this idea of two-factor authentication. Two-factor authentication provides a, that, that kind of second barrier of security. So even if our username and our password is compromised and the attacker is trying to log into our account, they, don't, they do not have the, you know, the kind of the prompt from our phone. They often come in the form of an SMS. Um, it's even better if you can use some type of application instead of the SMS, because that way, if we don't share that with people, you know, there's no way they log in into our accounts. And Realistically, the, these things, if you if you try and practice these safe, you know, sa these safe online tips, you know, day in and day out, you become a lot more cyber aware and you become a much harder victim for people to to go after. And it might just be that factor that keeps you from falling victim or, or clicking that phishing email and, and your data being stolen. But with that, I just want to thank you um, and, and obviously hand back over to, to Angela and we'll probably come back to the questions. We, we, won't, we won't deal with them right now. Thank you so much, Jason, and I think you've given us all a lot to sort of think about in terms of our, our daily habits and what we actually do online. And I, one of the things that's always intrigued me about the dark web is how, you know, it, it cyber is a really big industry these days, or cyber sort of hacking is a really big industry. 
and um, the dark wig mirrors things that marketplaces that we're familiar with. So take a lot. And I think you, you know, you've mentioned how you can review um, a purchase, you can rate somebody, you can, you know, you can give feedback, you can do returns. So it really operates in very similar ways to, to you know, things like a take a lot. Um, it's an industry. So I think, you know, thank you for reiterating why we all need to be so careful. Um, before we go to questions, and we do have a few questions, I'd just like to, uh, Jason, maybe if you can just transition the slides for me, but I'd just like to take you briefly through a few things that we as Kuro do. Um, and I think for us, uh, cyber security and security of our learners generally is our number one priority. That is the most important thing for us. So there are a few things that we do, and I won't be able to go through all of them today, but just touch on a few things. So the first is we um, onboard our Windows devices um, uh, to enable all of our policies. And Jason mentioned a little bit earlier how important it is to do the updates and and not just for, um, you know, for the new functionality, because that's where all the patches, the security patches come in. So if you've not heard of onboarding before, you may, if you've got, if your uh, child has got a device at school, one of the teachers may have said to you, may we onboard your child's device? And we highly recommend that at that point in time, you do accept that. Onboarding just means that you're connecting your child's device to our services, to Kuro services, to enable all of these security policies that we've been talking about. So policies really are the processes and the controls that we put in place so that we can manage all of these devices and so that we can, can so that we can can keep your child safe as well as all of the data on their device. So there are a few things that it would make sure that we can do, make sure that nobody else can log into that device or access your child's profile from another device. Um, like we said before, it means that all the, the security software is constantly updated. Um, it also installs with, with um, uh, assists with installing software. So if there is an update, we can actually manage that and do it while the ch your, your child is at school rather than doing it at home. So that's the first thing is to, to allow uh, your Kuro school to onboard your child's device to Azure. Um, a second option, and this is the second best option. The first best option is, is Azure onboarding, which is what I've just explained. The second is that they, they can load certificates, um, and that is something that would need to be done at the school, um, and your child can ask their teacher for help, and there's a process in place to do that. And really, a certificate just allows learners to connect their devices to the Kuro network, even if they've not been onboarded. Um, and again, it helps us creating policies and, and processes uh, to keep both le the learners, their devices and data all safe. But the first priority is the Azure onboarding. Um, then Jason, if you can go to the next slide, and this is really just to reiterate passwords, and Jason spoke a lot about unique passwords. Um, these things can sometimes be really irritating. It's irritating having to change a password every three or four months. It's irritating that you've got to think of one that is complica complicated enough that it's actually going to accept it. But I think Jason's given you all the good reasons that um, we all just need to make this as you know part of our daily habits. So we actually use a tool called MyPass, and um, you are able to access this tool to help your child reset their password. And I'll share the link in the chat shortly. Um, what you do need to do is make sure that you have updated or that your personal contact details are up to date um, with um, our systems because we SMS you a, a temporary password uh, to your primary, to the primary parent's email account. Um, and then you're able to go through the process of actually resetting that password. The password needs to be unique. It shouldn't be one, two, three, four. It shouldn't be your dog's name. Um, you really need to think carefully about how you can make it unique and difficult. Uh, it's, it's generally a combination of, of characters, letters, caps, small, uh, small letters, etc., so that it's a really strong password. And I think this also helps in terms of um, bullying and all sorts of other scenarios that other people cannot guess your child's password. So I'll share that link shortly in the chat. Um, lastly, just two, two other points. There are a number of how-to videos on our uh, Kuro uh, YouTube like, link or site channel. So we'll share that link in the chat as well. So a lot of this information is there and there's some, some how-to guides. 
And last but not least is if you are ever stuck, you can always email or call Coro Service Desk. Um, make sure that you give all of your details and one of the Service Desk agents will be able to help you um, with any of these matters. So now let's there have been some some great questions along the way. Um, so they had they, somebody asked, how can I avoid email phishing? So I think Jason, you you did touch on that, and I think it's about you know verifying. But maybe you just want to sort of briefly summarize that again. Oh, you're just muted. <laughs> hey. Looks like it's not letting you unmute for some reason. <laughs> well, I'll try and answer that while you're um, while you're unmuting. So I think as Jason sort of reiterated, always you know have a. Are you expecting the email first and foremost? Um, check the actual email address. Does it look like it's um, the right email? Check if you hover over it, you can actually you can often see additional information. Does it look like it's actually from the right thing? Contact the person sending it. Um, and I think the bottom line is if it looks questionable, don't click on it. Um, don't take any chances. Jason, you 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 carry on. You're the expert here. <laughs> 100%. I, uh, I agree. What we really want to do is look for our red flags. And I love the idea of red flags because we want to look for things like spelling mistakes or, you know, um, weird, weird fonts and weird graphics and, you know, an email that like kind of gives you an off vibe. Additionally, like, what we also want to look for with phishing emails is if there are any links or attachments. Um, so with links, as mentioned, you know, um, the best thing to do is take the driver's seat and never directly click on that link. However, there's plenty of options with most of our, our you know, our email um, clients, whether you use Outlook or Mac Mail or, or Gmail, whatever it may be. You often quite, you, you quite often have an option to hover over the link and for it to tell you where that link actually goes. So what we'll what we'll see quite often is someone to send you an email and it'll say, you know, LinkedIn.com there. So if you hover over those links, you can quite often see that it's, you know, in fact, not going to LinkedIn.com. And then also files, um, you know, a good example was in, in our example, we saw that there was a, a word file. So you want to look out for dangerous files, anything that's like um, JS for JavaScript or docx is an executable word file. Um, EXEs are a horrible one that hopefully you never see in your inbox. And then in, in general, um, you know, really look out for emails that you aren't expecting. Um, you know, if something doesn't sit right, it probably is not right. And then well, my favorite one is, um, and, and I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but you probably haven't won, you know, the, the, you probably haven't won the lotto and been notified by your email. <laughs> um, so always be cautious of those. Well, Gates is not going to be sending you $10 million. <laughs> exactly. Um, then we have got another question. How do you stop popping up of inappropriate ads on sites that you're looking at, especially when you're watching movies online? And also, how do we protect our kids from seeing these, lest they be tempted to click on them? So I don't know if you've got any guidance on that. So the, the, the pop-up ads are, are quite an interesting one. Um, there, there's some services where you won't find those, such as you know your, your Netflix or your Disney Plus. They'll, you'll, you pay the subscription to avoid seeing you know, adverts generally. Um, the, the websites, if the if you are streaming websites off um, questionable sites, uh, then unfortunately you do get those pop-ups. Sometimes you can get an ad blocker, which come as you know file extend or, or browser extensions that you can utilize. Um, however, you know that's one of those things that I always you know try and urge for caution um, when using browser extensions such as ad blockers. You really want to do your research and you know find out if this thing that you're allowing to modify you know, settings on your computer is actually safe. So ad blockers are a great option, but you know, don't install them willy nilly as well as any other browser extensions. Um, when it comes to you know, monitoring what, what content children see, quite often your home routers, if you log into your home routers, you'll find this often a setting called parental control, where you can go and set are there certain sites that you don't want um, your, your, your internet to access. Um, and then you'll be able to set up profiles and everything there. So if you, if you saw one of you certain sites, then you can. There's also a great way to you know limit and monitor different different sites. You know from Facebook to YouTube to uh, adult content sites, etc. Yeah, great. And I, when my daughter is wanting games, I generally always we she knows that she's not allowed to load anything on her own. 
I read through the overview. If there are ads, like you said before, often you can actually pay a little bit of money and get the version that doesn't have the pop up ad, which is sometimes probably money well spent. Um, another useful site I think uh, to look at is one called Common Sense Media. And if you just put your game or whatever your kids are using, that gives you a really good overview um, on what the game is about, you know, what age appropriate uh, or what age is it appropriate for it, etc. So I think that's another good site uh, just to use in terms of looking at games generally. OK, so this is a good question. I had this question too. Is it safe to accept cookies and what what are what happens if I reject them? So the, the, this is an interesting one. Um, so cookies have become quite an interesting field at the moment um, because we, we've seen a, a big push in in terms of you know um, uh, data privacy. So this is where we see you know your your Poppy X and your um, what they call GDPR X coming through. So nowadays you do have a lot of rights around your data and what you can do with the data and who has access to the data. So one thing, if you really do want to go down the rabbit hole, um, most companies or most websites will have either a GDPR notification page or a Poppy notification page where you can read about what they're doing with your data. And quite often you can you know, kind of find out what some of these cookies are doing. Um, with cookies, so yes, you can, you can not allow them. Um, some sites will like limit some of the functionality on the site. Most of the time you are okay to, to click that I don't, I don't want them. Um, if the site doesn't function correctly, there's always the option to you know refresh the browser, go out, come back in, and you'll probably be prompted again for those cookies. Um, cookies most of the time are, are not you know nefarious. Um, attackers understand and have learned how to deal and how to use cookies in a bad way. But most of your sites that you're using nowadays, your big sites should be programmed securely. What these cookies are mostly doing is enhancing your browser experience. So the cookies will record data about your, your sessions and they'll keep you signed in so that you can, you don't have to log in you know, every time you open the web page. They might keep data about your interests on a website so that they can give you targeted ads, et cetera. Um, so for the most part, for a security reason, um, you know, cookies aren't, you know, inherently you know bad um, where we see problems come in is these cookies are often you know, like sold around companies and then this is where you see targeted ads across you know youtube and facebook um, and, they, and they use that to kind of they, they use your privacy against you so this is where poppy and gdpr come into play really nasty so you can revoke that data and quite often you can view your data as well Great, Jan. I've actually found as I've become more aware of all of these things, you again, you think that it's going to be a long sort of um, a lot of admin to not accept a cookie. But actually, if you go in, you literally just um, often it's just one click of a button and you don't have to accept them if you decide you're not willing to. So it's, it's not really it doesn't really take that much time. Um, I think that so there's a question around phishing again, but I think we probably covered that. Um, then there was the YouTube channel name, which we have shared. Um, have I missed any others? Um, I think that is it. Thanks, Sean. You also shared Common Sense Media, which is a useful, which is a useful link. So Jason, thank you so much for spending the evening with us. Um, I think we have already invited you to do a talk for our teachers on social media and how to stay safe on social media. So we'd love for you to do that for uh, parents and guardians in term four as well. Um, we, we had people that decided they were gonna close all their social media accounts, but we can't keep them. We just need to be aware. We need to make sure we're looking after ourselves. So we'll do a session, we'll, we'll do a session on that soon. Thank you so much, everybody, for joining us. Um, I hope that you are feeling equipped um, and understand why cybersecurity is important and that you've got some tips and tricks that you can use to look after yourselves. Have a great evening and thank you so much again, Jason. We'll see you soon.